All right, and welcome to the Helicopter Podcast. I'm Halsey Schreider, and special thanks to Vertical Helicast for making this podcast possible. Also, a big thank you to our sponsors of the Helicopter Podcast, Celicopter and Bell Helicopter. Uh, Always very excited to do the podcast, as you know, and today is a super fun one. We've been actually reaching out. We've been going on Instagram and we've been trying to find people that have really cool content, really cool jobs. And so far, we've had two uh, individuals join the podcast uh, from that way of us kind of looking out into the industry. And they've uh, both been European. So today's guest is actually uh, joining us all the way from Switzerland. His name is Lucas Riva. Lucas, what's happening? How are you? I'm fine, thanks. All good. And you? I'm doing good, man. What, what time is it there right now? It's uh, about, uh, let's get close to 8 p.m. Oh, man. Well, I appreciate you. Uh, I'm sure you worked all day. And uh, what, what time is it here? It's about 1040 in the morning where I'm at here in Central Oregon. So I appreciate you uh, making this happen. And I'm just so excited to have you on the podcast. I have to say, um, in stalking you on Instagram, uh, your content, the, the videos that you're posting flying in the mountains is absolutely incredible. How long have you been uh, posting, you know, content on Instagram and, and what kind of response and feedback have you been getting from those awesome videos that you're placing? Well, I would say like uh, it's about 10 years that I'm using Instagram since it, it became uh, like uh, popular. But uh, in the recent times, I use it a little bit more because I saw that a lot of people enjoy uh, the content I create. I, I do it just for fun. But uh, in another way, I also see that he creates a lot of contacts. And right now in the podcast, in the podcast, it's a, a great example of how I'm connecting to people and uh, to company around, uh, I would say, around the world. That's a very interesting thing. Yeah, 100%. You know, I think social media is, um, is evil in some ways, <laughs> uh, but also very positive in others. I think, I think if we use it, for positivity and good things, then it's a, it's an amazing tool. It's a way to stay in touch with old friends and family. Uh, but even more importantly, it's a way to connect with, uh, new people. And we're really seeing it on the aviation side, specifically with a lot of content creators now, uh, who are just normal pilots that have super cool jobs that are allowing, uh, their Instagram, uh, friends and followers to kind of live vicariously through uh, what you're doing. And I think that's really cool. And and helicopters are pretty easy content because even if you're a non-helicopter person who doesn't love watching helicopter content, maybe I'm biased, but yeah. uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, pretty, sure. it's pretty awesome. So Lucas, I'm curious, uh, you know, we don't know each other. I, I don't really know too much about your history or, or what got you into flying. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, part of the podcast is I just love to hear your journey within helicopters uh, yeah. because a lot of our listeners may be, you know, where you were, say, 10 years ago when you're starting your career uh, in Europe. Uh, so I just love to kind of hear how, you know, where you went to training, how you trained, what your training was like. And uh, kind of what you've been up to as you've progressed within your uh, helicopter career. Okay. So let's say that I started as I was very young to be fascinated by helicopter. It was uh, thanks to the family. My grandpa was an airplane pilot, a private pilot. Then my dad also worked a lot in the helicopter industry. And uh, so I was really confronted with the helicopters, I would say, like uh, in a weekly way. Every week I was confronted with an helicopter. And uh, what really allowed me to start and really put me into the, into the, the path to become a pilot was uh, the radio-controlled, indus- radio-controlled helicopters uh, industry. I was flying them for fun. Then it became, for a few years, my job. I, when I finished school, I was traveling around the world and flying the radio-controlled helicopters. I had sponsors. I've been paid for it. So I learned many languages that really helped me uh, today and wow. most of it was the fact that uh, being paid and by competing I was gaining a little bit money that uh, I immediately invested into the the pilot career that's what uh, actually I did to begin 
uh, to become a pilot. And there, so real fast, real fast, I have to interrupt because I'm so curious about this. (laughs) So you started with radio control helicopters, and through radio control helicopters, you were able to travel around the world and get paid. Yep, and sponsored. That's incredible. Now, I uh, back in the day, I I was uh, I was I think I was around fifteen, and I was walking around the high school near my house, and I ran into this guy, and he was flying a, a, a gas powered uh, RC helicopter. It was a Raptor thirty, if you're familiar. Yeah, I and I was like mind blown. I was like, this is the coolest thing that I've <laughs> ever seen. And so uh, thank you to my mom and dad. I think they, uh, I connected with this guy. His name was Ian. He was like, I don't know, he was probably 55 or so at that time. He's a little bit older now, obviously, and he's actually still a, a very good friend of mine. Uh, so through that connection, I ended up buying a Raptor 30 myself and, or my parents bought me a Raptor 30. And Ian helped me kind of construct it or build it and taught me how to fly it. But I was never that good at flying it. I could kind of, you know, I could fly it around, but mostly I would crash. Uh, They were very hard to fly. Uh, They've gotten so much easier, it seems like. So I'm I'm guessing you were doing like the really crazy stuff where the helicopter is going upside down and doing weird flips uh, and circles. 3D, we call it 3D. So that's what you were doing? Yeah, exactly. I've been the 2008 world champion. That's why I got some money and some sponsor. And I paid my private license. I paid completely my private license with the money I gained from the radio control industry. And I promise I'm laughing because I think that is absolutely awesome. Like I <laughs> I love radio control. A lot of my uh, younger years were, were spent putting together radio control airplanes. Helicopters were very frustrating. It, the, that, that Raptor 30... Uh, had to get put together a lot. Uh, yeah. it, was, and it was always having issues with it. Uh, but that is so cool that uh, that you were able to do that. How long did it take to get like good at being able to fly at that level? Well, let's say the first three years were very hard. They crashed a lot and I didn't have like a, a good radio controlled helicopter. Uh, then we switched to a better one. And from that day on, uh, I really improved my skills very fast. So I entered into this business and it was cool because in the late years, there were no drones. So the market was uh, at had his peak and we were really enjoying that time. I was traveling, for example, to Taiwan competing with maybe 1000 people watching us and we were signing autographs and all stuff like that. <laughs> we had models as well around us. But it was, uh, it was really a nice thing. I met a lot of people around the world. This also involved me in the, the social media because uh, I still keep the contacts in Facebook, for example, from people uh, I don't see maybe since 10, 15 years, but they, I had good, uh, good times with them. So uh, sometimes I'd send a message, how are you, how's going the family and everything. It could be a guy from uh, Las Vegas, could be a guy from uh, Shanghai, from Taiwan and stuff like that. So. Uh, oh man, that's super really cool. Nice bet I did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's it's a uh, the cool thing about radio, excuse me, radio controlled is it's really a pathway for young people to get into aviation. I don't know how it works in Europe, but you know, as a kid, yeah, you can go fly if you're if you're you know, if you have a family friend that has a plane or a helicopter. But you really can't pursue anything until you're 15, 16, 17 years old. And I remember that was like so annoying to me because I just always wanted to be a pilot. And so doing the radio control stuff was a way for me to kind of get my fix without actually doing, you know, quote unquote, the real thing. Pretty frustrating though. I did crash a lot of aircraft uh, (laughs) on the radio (laughs) control uh, side, but uh, it was always a good time. We had like a a radio controlled airport about uh, 25, 30 minutes from my house. Yeah. And my buddy Austin and I used to go there, uh, you know, spring and summer on the weekends. And again, thank you, mom and dad, for paying for that stuff and <laughs> driving me, you know, all all over, <laughs> you know. Yeah, the same so year. it's, it's the same lucky year. to have, you know, I think I think having good parents that support that stuff is is pretty awesome. 
Okay, so you do the radio control, 2008 world champion, not a big deal. And you use the money uh, that you're making from doing that to uh, start your actual helicopter training. So did you uh, do all of your training in Europe? Uh, yes, I did all of my training in Europe. I would say I did a little bit of training in uh, in Texas, but it was a little bit of our buildings. So I had like a gap between uh, my, uh, let's say, high mountain course that is in Switzerland is mandatory uh, to get to the commercial license. So I spent uh, like two or three weeks, I don't remember exactly, uh, time in, in Texas flying uh, mostly at night because it was really dark and I was really enjoying it. So but I would say 95% I've done everything in Europe. Oh, that's cool. Where in Texas were you? Sorry? What what part of Texas were you in? Uh, I was, uh, oh, I don't remember the name of the city. Uh, it, it, will be, it will come. Just give me okay, it will come. <laughs> I, I lived in Texas for uh, about 10 years. So okay. I've done a lot of flying there. I flew air medical in Texas. Okay. Uh, absolutely very dark uh, in the... There's a lot of uh, light in the big cities, and then there's just nothing for hundreds of miles. It gets very, very yeah. dark. So I definitely know what you're talking about on <laughs> on that level. So it was, a, it was a, a, absolutely a great training because in, in Europe you don't find that absolutely. You have the mountains, but to really have like a flat surface for miles, everything is black. And I do remember we were flying like a Hughes 300, so not with a lot of instruments. Was yeah, really, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would be that would be interesting. I remember one time I was um <clears throat> I was flying an aircraft, a, a Bell helicopter uh from uh, a town called San Angelo back to Del Rio, Texas, which is on the border of of Texas and the Mexico border. And it, I don't know, it's probably a 2-hour flight or just under 2 hours. And in between there's nothing. I mean, there's literally nothing. And uh, I was flying air medical. So we, we flew with night vision goggles. And so I could see through the night vision goggles. And I remember I pulled my goggles up for a second just to see. And I mean, it literally just looked like a black wall. I mean, there was yeah. like no reference. DC. Yeah, no reference to anything, you know, and I was thinking, man, I'm glad I have a glass cockpit with autopilot and, you know, instrumentation because, even though I'm VFR and there's not a cloud in the sky, I might as well feel IFR because I literally cannot see anything. So, I mean, it's really wild to be uh, in a situation where it's like that dark out. Certainly good experience. Absolutely. <laughs> so I, a lot of my friends, and I talked about this on a recent podcast too, but I'm kind of curious to hear your take. A lot of my buddies at uh, flight school where I went in the United States, they're all European. Uh, a lot of a lot of this, in fact, being American was like a minority. We had tons of Norwegians, some individuals from Switzerland, Germany, Austria. I mean, you name it. And it was my understanding that it's like a little bit cheaper to learn in the United States. What was your decision making process to do most of your training in Europe compared to coming over to the United States? Well, it's uh, I get a lot of questions from people also by Instagram or by email about this thing. Like, let's say like in Switzerland, if you want to do as low and work in the mountains, uh, you really need to, to be born here, learn here and fly here. This is very important. Switzerland, it's a very difficult place to fly. I, I don't want to say like because uh, we see the many videos maybe from Zermatt or stuff like this. But now with, uh, with the experience I have, I can really say it's, uh, it's a very, very different place to fly uh, in respect to, for example, I've been to Italy. I've been a little bit a moment also in France uh, for some training. But uh, the, the, the fact that you go to the USA and you learn to fly there, it's good because it gets you a license. You spend a little bit less. And anyway, you have to convert it in European and you have to do the... I would say the shittiest part, permit me. Yeah, the, the testing. Theory, yeah, the theory is absolutely <laughs> crazy. Uh, like in Europe, it's uh, it makes no sense to me. But that's yeah. Aren't you guys doing like team. a weight yeah. and balance for a, a seven thirty seven? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we have to learn how many fire extinguisher you need for a seven three seven. You have to be able to uh, plan uh, a fly on the maps from uh, Zurich to New York, and 
I fly an <laughs> H-125 at the seat. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll never do it. I, I, yeah. The pilots of the airlines doesn't do it anymore, but that's it. We have we have to pass this exam, so you're going to do. To come yeah, back you do, you to do. what I was saying, it's like uh, the company here, once you're a pilot, you have a commercial license, you have it uh, from Europe or you have it from USA, they want to know you. They want to know the experience you have in this environment. You can maybe be a really good uh, pilot like in, in the US. Yeah, you, you were talking about your experience. NVG goggles, flying a twin engine maybe uh, at night. It's a lot of things that in Switzerland only a few pilots does. Let's, if you see only for the rescue. And we don't have that kind of operation, but we have mostly the ESL operation, the high mountain transport. So I, I, in the training side, you're already leaving the environment. You see how the winds can change, how the weather can change, like in, in, in a few seconds even. Uh, so I do think that to be a good pilot in Switzerland, when you have not enough experience, when you are in the first stage, let's say from 500 to 1,000 hours, having done your training in Switzerland absolutely helps. And yeah, 100%. This, this is also appreciated by the companies because <clears throat> uh, they have to give you a machine and you have to be able to go at landing at 2,000 meters immediately because that's what we have. We don't have a lot of uh, Shenik tours, maybe in some region, yes, but for example, in mine, we do maybe 5% is a Shenik fly or or a charter fly. We do mostly the ESL stuff. Now, for our listeners out there that may not understand what HESLO is, what is that? So uh, it's the sling transportation of charges. Uh, in, in Switzerland, it's divided in levels. You can go from ESLO 1, that is helicopter externa sling load operation. Sorry, I didn't get it before. Uh, you can go from ESLO 1 to ESLO 4. ESLO 1 is a line that goes up to, I have to convert it a bit in feet, but about 60 feet. Okay. Uh, ESLO 2 is more than 60 feet. And then you have ESLO 3, that is uh, the log inside and the special logging as well. That's when okay. we cut the trees that stay still. We cut the, the, we chop the trees off. And then you go to ESLO 4, that is actually the construction, for example, of a house, of an antenna, and stuff like this. It's, uh, it's not only the transport, but you really have to construct something. And this is what we, every company, I would say most of the company does in Switzerland. And this goes together with the flight school because we have also many flight schools in Switzerland. Okay. So you're, you're kind of learning all that as part of your training and, and it, and it makes complete sense of what you're saying that the, the environment, the flying environment in Switzerland is so unique to that area that by training there, by learning there, and understanding that that area uh, is going to make you a better, safer pilot. And it makes sense that a company would want that. You know, if 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 they if they get two resumes on the desk and it's Lucas that did all the training in Switzerland and understands it all, and Halsey who did all of his training in the states and has some mountain training experience, they're going to pick. The, yeah. the guy that's actually done all the training in Switzerland. So that, in that does make many complete companies sense. companies pick you also, uh, you work as a task specialist or you work in the office as dispatcher. You really grow in the company before you really start to take the transmission. I also did the task specialist for five years and uh, this really helps you a lot in, in the future because now when I, I take a job, I have already been below the helicopter. I know how the job is done. I only have to think yep. about flying. And this really helps in the in the first stage when you really have to um, control the helicopter, control the load, and you don't have time to think how this work has to be done. I mean, you, you already know it. So uh, many companies now in Switzerland, they start to train their young pilots. Uh, you work in the company, as I said, as a dispatcher, as a task specialist or stuff like that. And then slowly you get to the pilot seat. Bill is proud to sponsor Vertical Helicasts and their vision to hold meaningful mission, safety, and best practice conversations in the helicopter industry. The lessons learned from these conversations will undoubtedly shape the future of both new and veteran helicopter operators. And I think yeah, no, it's the right way. I mean, I think that's awesome. And I've, and I've said that on the podcast before, that if you are interested in pursuing a career in aviation, specifically helicopter aviation, 
working within a helicopter operation at any capacity is such a great idea. Um, for, for me personally, you know, I started with line service. So refueling aircraft, tugging around aircraft, and it's really neat because you're around helicopters and airplanes all day long, something that you're passionate about. And you get to learn so much about the industry just by being around it and being yeah. around the people. And as a pilot, I 100% agree with you. If you have that foundation of knowledge of the other jobs within an organization, then I think that makes you a better, more well-rounded pilot. So I think that that's pretty cool. So you you, you start your training Kind of just walk me through what the training is like in Switzerland uh, to get you guys prepared for doing kind of the complex operations that you guys do. Yeah, maybe maybe not in the first stage. I mean, like the private license is very, uh, I, I would say basic, but basic, it doesn't sound good in English, I know, but it's very well structured and you really, you like on rails when you fly. I mean, uh, we are Swiss, we are precise and that's it. The private license, you have to be really precise precise uh, but it gu guides you through what actually uh, are the dangers we already have i mean it's not only about flying the helicopter it already prepares a little bit for what is coming next because i would say in switzerland maybe few guys that really have the money uh, do the private license and only fly as a private but due to the laws we have it doesn't make sense you can't land outside practically anywhere you can't land in the mountains so you just fly around people. So I would say 95% start with the PPL and we know as the, the fly school knows and the, the operator knows that you're going to be going forward. After that, you finish with uh, your 50 hours. I think it's similar to, to what you have in the USA. And uh, let's say you have two ways, the, the modular way where you do your license from zero to commercial license, you stay like every day in the school you study and you fly, but uh, you can save, uh, I would say, like 30 hours if I'm not wrong. I mean, I'm, I am instructor, but I, I don't practice it. So I don't remember exactly. Sure. I, I say I'm precise, but not exactly. But um, you save some hours, but it doesn't make sense again, because when you have uh, 170 hours, you just simply don't find a job. That's, that's it. Of course. And we, we all know this. Or you gain the experience as I did, like a little bit of hours building around uh, to save the money. That's absolutely possible. You can go to Italy, you can go to the USA. In fact, Switzerland is a little bit more expensive than anywhere in Europe or USA. And um, what we have that is different from also European countries is that we must, as a Swiss uh, holder of a Swiss license, we must do a mountain course. This takes uh, about 250 landings above a certain altitude. And then you have to visit uh, at least 30 or 40 landing places that are above 2,500 meters up to 4,000. And uh, you have to do them once. So you, you do all the tour of the Switzerland. Most of them are in valleys, uh, in Grigioni, I don't know in English how it, how it sounds, but they are on, on the Alpen side. And uh, after that, you ca you're allowed as a private to land in this mountain area or wow. when you will be commercial pilot to land above 1,100 meters. So this is uh, something you can do in between from your private license and the commercial. And it makes sense okay. because you have to, to build hours. So uh, you, you do that. Uh, the problem is that is also quite expensive because we are talking about 30 to 40 flying hours. So, and it's a must for a Swiss pilot. It's not for the people coming outside working in Switzerland. If they can show they have experience, they only need to do about 20 landings and a skill test. But for us, it's mandatory. So this is about 30,000 to 40,000 uh, US dollars. Wow. And then you yeah, still I mean, have again cheap. to do the commercial <laughs> license. So you yeah. have to do again 30 hours. So that's why you see many people just try to go on the... On, on the no, on, on the USA way because it, it costs less. But then when you come back, you still need a little bit more. So I don't know. On a balance, I don't know if it doesn't doesn't make sense. It does make sense or not. But. Yeah, I mean, it seems like maybe for some of the other European countries and the jobs that you may have, whether it's air medical or flying offshore, 
then maybe going to the US and getting a little bit of cheaper training is the best option. But you know what I'm learning here and talking with you is that if you want to fly specifically in Switzerland, then you really have to be sharp with yeah. the mountain flying and and it's not just being sharp, it's it's a requirement. I I understand that it comes at significant cost, but that has to be pretty amazing training being able to go and fly and do all these off airport landings yeah, on mountains the, and things the, like the that. The mountain course is the most beautiful course I ever did. And uh, it'd be amazing. The most useful, I would say. I mean, there are many things that in aviation you say, yeah, you have to do it, but it's not so useful. Uh, maybe because it comes from the airline side, but the mountain course was actually the most beautiful I did. Uh, I really enjoyed it and I really learned from it. And still today when I fly in, in the high mountain, I, I, I do remember the techniques they were teaching me and, and I used them actually because uh, this was uh, very, very interesting. What aircraft were you doing your training in for the mountain course? Well, for the mountain course, I use a uh, EC-120, the, okay. the, the Colibri. Um, now, a lot of people use also the Robinson 44 or the 66, which okay. get a little bit more power. Uh, it all depends because then also the insurance asks a little bit of turbine experience. So you have to balance your training. And depending from which company you're growing on, uh, you also have to, uh, you also need the hours on type. In my case, I did the H25. I did before finishing my commercial license, I already had like 30 or 40 hours on that machine. Wow. But yeah, but the day after the insurance accepted me to fly for, uh, for passengers. If not, when you finish, you do the type rating and then you still lack about 30 hours that I don't know how you build this experience in Switzerland. And, uh, that would, then, yeah, that would be yeah, they, difficult. They, we choose the 120 because also it, it, it in, with the altitude is not so big performance that doesn't have that much performance. So you really are on the limit as well with those machines because you go full of, uh, of fuel up to 3,500 and you start to train. So, yeah, I've never, uh, I don't have any 120 experience, but what I do know of the 120 is that uh, it's not an aircraft that's known to be extremely powerful. No, uh, in fact, in fact, I hear it's a bit of a dog. So, you know, being able to train in the mountains in an aircraft that's going to be more power limited uh, probably only enhances your overall skill. You know, if you can, yeah. if you can fly the operation in an aircraft that maybe shouldn't be doing that operation, then you're just going to be a better around it pilot. So, all right. So you get through your mount training, you get through uh, the commercial training. What was kind of your path to now getting to where you're at today? Well, uh, since the day I get the commercial, it was uh, 2017, if, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I just simply invented myself because I have, I said, I have the license. Uh, I'm allowed to fly an uh, EC-125 because I had the hours. And now I have to find someone who let me fly at first. And I said, this is pretty hard to find and expect that uh, you're building hours just because you just because I'm Lucas and uh, take the helicopter and go fly at my place or go fly at the place of the pilots I'm paying. So that's also a, a problem. And I said, okay, uh, I work in this way. I don't ask to fly. I bring clients. I bring my flights to the company. And they showed that I can do it. That's what I, wow. uh, how I started. The, the, the first week I was working in, in, in my first company, uh, I was not working 100%. I was working on the weekends, for example. Uh, I was lucky that we had the, um, the World Ski Competition in St. Moritz. And as the fly was like a 20 minutes and was a special event, the authorities opened a landing area straight to the, to the, to the runs. And uh, we were able to transport every day about uh, one, two, three helicopters uh, over there. So I said, I organize everything that I do the advertising, I do, I do the organization and do the planning, but I fly. And that's how I did. So for two weeks, wow. every day, I was going in the morning, coming back in the evening, I take vacation and that's it. In like two weeks, you build your first 20 hours. So, and from that day that's on, really I cool. it in this way. Every weekend, uh, organizing a scenic fly. Uh, I was going into the mountain with people because I could use those uh, special landing places. I was doing scenic fly at the small events in the in the villages. I was looking around and saying, "What can I do?" 
and let's try. So in the first year, I built about 150, 180 hours in this way. Man, and that's awesome. I also I mean, bring some talk money ab- to the company so that they were happy about it. Yeah, I mean, talk about uh, hustling, you know, to, to get what, yeah. you, what you need. You know, I think in this world, especially this day and age, you know, we're just always looking for someone to give us something, kind of a handout. No, and so for you to... For you to go out and and actually earn the business to then put yourself uh, in the seat, uh, that's pretty awesome and very commendable. Uh, you you got some you got some serious hustle. I don't know if you all use the the term hustle in in Switzerland, but uh, in a different way. But I know what you mean. Yeah. You know what I mean. Okay, good. Yeah, it's a good thing. I uh, I like people that hustle, so it's pretty cool to hear that you went out there. And I think it's important for our listeners. What at any job, anything that you're doing, uh, you know, if you can bring value to an employer, then they're going to compensate you not only with hopefully money, but also uh, they're going to compensate you by allowing you to fly the aircraft that they own. Yeah. So that's a, a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool way to do it. I always say when you reach your commercial license, you start your training because actually. 100%. You only have a paper in, in your hand, but then is where you where you start everything. And uh, even if, because you study a lot, you finish and you say, yeah, I did my license. I'm a pilot. I will apply to every company I see in the world. But then you realize that it's it's damn hard. I mean, it's really, really hard. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult, especially for, you know, the way that you did it there. I mean, the United States says it a little bit different. 90, I don't know the actual percentage, but I would say it's probably close to, you know, 85 or 90% of people, their first job in the United States is as a flight instructor. Yeah. You know, you finish your training and you go straight into flight instruction and that has its pros and cons. One of the pros is that you're able to get a lot of flight time pretty quickly. And then there's a lot of entry level positions that will allow you to get paid and also transition into say a turbine helicopter, uh, something like that as you but get a thousand hours. What is also happening here in Europe at the moment. Oh, like really? Bit, yeah. Uh, I see like in, in Switzerland as well, the first job you can get is probably as an instructor because you just finish into the company. Uh, and as you say, pro and cons, uh, the pro, I think you're, you're very precise on procedures. You're very trained and you're very skilled on the theory and, and what you need to learn. Uh, what you need to teach to the people but then you also have a huge lack of experience again because how can you teach someone let's say for a private pilot it's no problem but for a commercial how can you teach a commercial how to avoid a, a dangerous situation when you haven't been into it yet i mean and and in our country i, I don't think is actually the, the the perfect way the perfect path but uh, due to the insurance, due to the license, due to the companies, this is what is going to happen. And uh, if it works in the U.S., it would work also here. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think if you can have, you know, the first, you know, priority number one is safety. You know, as long as as you can be an instructor and you can teach a student and you can do it safely, then okay, that's top priority. And somehow it's pretty safe. Like the, you know, there's actually not that many training accidents. In the United States, you would think there would be a lot more because, you know, hey, you got 200 hours of flight time and now you're teaching someone. I mean, it's you don't have a ton of experience, but I can personally say that the best training that I ever got was from instructors that had industry experience. Uh, I got very lucky to be able to fly with our chief instructor at Hillsborough a lot when I was the assistant chief and he had come back into the flight school world. He had been off for 10 years or so flying all sorts of missions, doing a lot of external load, air medical. So he knew the industry and he knew helicopters really well. And so for me to be able to be in the cockpit with him, he was able to teach me all those things. And you're hundred percent right. You know, when you're a load time instructor, you can't teach that stuff. All you can teach is how to actually fly the helicopter, but you're not able to actually provide this extra knowledge of kind of just the whole picture. So I see both sides for sure. I agree. I agree. Also, you teach the, the experience you have, the, 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 the scary moment you have, you teach them, you teach to avoid them. But 100%. Uh, it's important. You, you have to be scared sometimes. You have to understand where is the limit 
when you're going too far. I mean, if if you always fly in in all the standard uh, circumstances, I mean, I mean, at least in, in our job in in the ESL, it's very difficult to be precisely standard and following all the the, the recommendation because there's so many things happening in one moment that you clearly miss something and you find yourself in a shitty position. Like uh, could be on the downwind side of a hill with uh, 1,000 uh, kilos or 2,000 libras below the helicopter. So uh, I think the, the, the fact that he come back, it, it will give him absolutely a, a plus on the instructing side. And, 100%. No, I, yeah, no, I agree. So that first year you get about 150 hours, you hustle to get that. Uh, what, what happened after that time? How did you just kind of keep rolling and keep building time experience? After that, I was reaching the another milestone that by us is the 350 uh, piloting command hours. Uh, because from uh, that moment, you can start the ESLO training. Uh, I was pushing a lot on it. And uh, the first time they gave me a try and a little bit like a present to see how, how it goes. It went well. And then for five to six months, it everything stopped again. Uh, everything stopped again. I was doing some missions sometimes, but not so so much uh, flying time. And as long you really need to be constant when when you're learning. Also, I see also when I when I don't fly for one month as a mission, uh, it really makes a difference. Kind and, knock uh, off some of the rust. Yeah, absolutely. And then at one point they decided that uh, it was a go, and uh, we slowly started to build some little bit more experience. I was a great jolly working uh, on the weekend, so taking small, some easy missions. And then uh, in the company, there was a, a huge change, like uh, one pilot quit, one pilot had a medical problem, and uh, one freelance pilot didn't want to, to work anymore as a ESLO pilot, he went by another road. And so here I am, I am the young pilot there, seated there waiting. And from one day to the other, just go outside and fly. That's it. And that's awesome. That's uh, what I did. I did like from ESLO 1 to ESLO 3. Uh, now we talk about one and a half year, two years time to, to get there. Also here where I work today, there is a young pilot that is already expecting to spend two years to get to the ESLO 3. I did that in three or four months. Wow. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's great because from one side, uh, you get there. I mean, after that, you, you have your license, you have your ESLO 3, it opens the world to you, uh, also to become a, a, a professional 100% of your time. In, in the other side, I, I missed some goals. Like, uh, I do remember coming back from home and saying to my girlfriend, hey, today this, this job was really good. And I, I flew like a 150 foot long line. And she was asking, what's next? Ah, yeah, next will be like uh, transporting a swimming pool with a longer long line. Two days after, uh, I've done it, and that's it. So I really burned my, a little bit of my steps, and this is what I also say to the young pilots, just uh, go slowly, enjoy every every new goal, set your next goal close to you, not expect like from ESLO 1 to be at ESLO 4 in six months, but really enjoy. That's what I haven't done, but it was a, a company requirements in that moment because... Uh, if not, we were losing work, and uh, that's it. And yeah, I, was I mean, lucky you also, just were, yeah, right place, I had right a time. With me all the time on the first uh, ESLO mission, and he was spending the days with me, and uh, uh, he was really helping. He had a huge experience, like sixty thousand flying hours, all in Switzerland. Uh, wow! And he was really, really, really a passionate uh, guy on teaching. And uh, I, I was really lucky to to have him in by my side, and this also speed up all my training. Absolutely. So I, I was, uh, I've not done a lot of external load operations. I've probably done about 15 hours all in a training environment. And, uh, man, it was really hard. It, I, you know, you, I think when I was doing my training, I probably had about a thousand hours total time already. So I've been flying helicopters for some time and I was teaching CFI training, instructor training, doing a lot of full downs. I was getting really good at that side of flying. And then getting into, you know, putting a line under the helicopter, I kind of felt like I was having to learn how to fly again. It was yeah. just yeah, so different. You can be able to fly the helicopter, but now you're flying the load. 
As always, a special thanks to Celicopter for producing this podcast. Specializing in helicopter evaluations, faster sales, and superb service, Celicopter is the go-to agency for clients expecting immediate results. Celicopter's team of helicopter professionals are the best in the business. Using their aviation expertise, a nationwide network, and a proprietary 76-step listing strategy, Celicopter will convert your listing from Mayday to Payday. Ready to get started? Text HELICOPTER to 1-855-CELICOPTER. That's HELICOPTER to 1-855-735-5226. And a Celicopter pilot agent will reach out. Celicopter. List it. Sell it. Done. It's not, it's not absolutely the same thing. Like, uh, when I fly with passengers, I fly really smooth. I like when the passenger doesn't feel the Gs or when they don't have the anxiety. When I fly the charges, I am not able to, to stay still. I mean, like uh, I'm moving the helicopter up and down, right and left, but it's because uh, I'm flying the charge below, but the charge is still there. It's, it's not moving. It's precise. I know. It's crazy. In fact, Overhead, in one of your I, videos. I'm moving like this all the time, yeah. And you can in one see of your videos, videos, I was of, watching, yeah. you yeah. know, but I've, but I've, and I, I've seen I that too. Them so that I look better on the video. So I edited the good part of, of, the, <laughs> of the video. <laughs> yeah, perfect. But it's so true. I mean, I've seen, um, I, I would go on, you know, and, 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 um, kind of observe with the guys that were getting carded for say the forest service to go and fight fires and they would be doing their testing. And, you know, I would be in the helicopter and I mean, the helicopter is going all over the place and the, and the load is doing nothing. It's just, you know, so it's like this crazy, you know, and I just, I don't have enough experience. I never, I never got to do it enough to feel comfortable or confident and to really fully understand it. What was, what were some of the challenges for you? If you can remember when you were learning how to do the uh, external load? Well, uh, for sure, as I said, the, the first way, I did my ASLO training and like, uh, I was really discovering a new mission every day. Like this was, uh, surely something I, I do remember of it. And after that, when I started to work, uh, hundred percent of my time in a company, uh, the management of the daily program becomes another aspect because there you are, you're, you're ready to fly. You're able to fly quite every mission. But then you really have to be on time because there is a, especially in Switzerland and the southern side of Switzerland, we fly for pro single helicopter about, uh, let's say, from 20 to 40 clients a day. So it means like 80 different landing sites or 60 to 80 different landing sites. And you have like uh, 12 or 15 task specialists moving around with their truck. They just get to the place of work 10 minutes before everything gets ready. You came with a long line, do the transportation and you're off and you move into another place to work. So this is another aspect you really have to manage. And I do remember the first time I was working on, on very full uh, flight programs. Uh, I, I do realize that, yeah, you really have to be careful about uh, how fuel you do, where you move your, your truck. You can have problems. Maybe this guy's not ready. You, you go to the under uh, place of work. And then you have to remember, you have to come back and do the fuel because you need two hours fuel to the next step. So this is a, another task. And on the recent times, now I'm working as a, a freelance uh, I quit my old company. I, I, let's say we have a discussion. So we, we agreed to, to quit together and uh, I had to find something and I'm lucky that I go to, to different companies in this moment. So I work in, in Italy, in the region of the Monte Rosa, where uh, I have very high mountains for what is Europe. We go up to uh, close to 15,000 feet and we do ASLO mission up there. Wow. On the, yeah, it's called the Regina Margherita Hut. And this is the highest refugee in Europe. So I, I do work for this service. So it's, uh, it's very interesting. And uh, then I work again in my home region for a few days uh, a month. And I also started as freelance for uh, two different company in the northern side of the Alps, uh, where the, the way to work is, is, is different. I mean, it's not totally different because actually the mission are the same, but uh, you have new people, new office, new uh, way of work, different materials as well, and uh, different language because we have language barriers as well. I'm 
my native language is Italian because I'm the southern side of Switzerland. I do speak Italian. Uh, but here, for example, I do work in, in German. I speak German all day. And now, for example, I'm talking to you in English. So uh, you really need to <laughs> adapt a lot. And I That's find awesome. This, yeah, I find this moment of my career. Uh, in the first months, I was a little bit upset for everything that's happened. I was scared as well because it's a diff difficult market. And uh, I'm going to have a baby in January, so I need a job. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, yeah got to get paid. Yeah, and uh, at the end, after five months, I, I can say a balance. I, I did the experience I never did in, in, in my whole life, in six months. Uh, today I was working, for example, in the region of Lauterbrunnen. It's a very famous place, also a very touristic uh, place. And we're just below the, the Jungfraujoch, that is a, a region that is uh, with peaks at uh, 4,000 meters. And uh, I was taking a little short break and watching all this mountain. And I said, yeah, I always dreamed to be here one day and flying in, in this region. And today I am. I always use flight simulator. And I was always flying in this region. So, uh, and now you're doing it. That not every day, everything comes in a bad way, but you really have to reorganize a little bit yourself. And actually, getting out of my comfort zone is pushing up my career in a in a very good way. Also, creating a lot of contacts, uh, a lot of friends around. So we'll see. We'll see what the, the future will bring on. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. I think that it's really easy to do what you're comfortable doing. And I think that's uh, in life, a recipe for not being very happy. And in the helicopter world, it, it could also lead to complacency. And so I think, I think that if you're willing to take some risks and invest in yourself, then uh, it's, it can be scary and it's a little intimidating, but it always seems to work out. I think that, at least in the United States that, you know, we're, we're taught about all these different investments that we can make. We can invest in the stock market and real estate, yeah. <laughs> but we're never taught to invest in ourselves. Yeah. It's like this fear of investing in yourself and doing things to further your career. And, you know, I've taken some risks uh, in my professional career that were really scary at the time but they seem to pay off higher than any investment that I've ever made. Yeah. And so you see that uh, later on as well. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. Short time. It's it takes time. To have a benefit in short time. I mean, you have to be time. willing to, to make the leap and then you have to put the work in. Yeah, and exactly. once you start doing that, it's kind of like this snowball. It just gets bigger and bigger and better and yeah. bigger. And it just, it's, it's a really neat thing. And so congratulations to you for, <laughs> Thank for you. making that step, for going outside of your comfort zone, because it sounds like you're doing some pretty incredible things. When you're flying a helicopter at 15,000 feet, specifically with a, a, a load underneath, yeah. I mean, what does the helicopter feel like at that altitude? I mean, I have no idea. I've really never flown anywhere close yeah. to that. It's it's difficult to explain. Like, I mean... Probably the, the real reaction of the helicopter can be explained more from one guy that flies it to, to the Everest at higher levels. Uh, what I can say is like over there, I'm, I'm pushing the machine on the limit because uh, we, we fly with about 500 kilos of load up to 15,000 feet. So we don't have a lot of reserve. Uh, you have to be careful with the winds. You can feel the machine a little bit more uh, like wobbling. I would say like, not so reactive because of the air. And uh, sure. you really see that every mistake you do, you, you pay it. Absolutely. You, you can do a small mistake with this altitude and with this load. If not, you have to interrupt your approach and try again. I mean, uh, here you see you have a little bit more margin. Like uh, you get a little bit tired. You do one approach a little bit too fast, uh, too short. You fix it. Uh, over there, you can't. You, it's a one way to go. And uh, the one way to go is in the last uh, 150 feet. That's it. You do something there. You, you, you miscalculate the wind as well. That's uh, a very important thing that I learned is to really read the wind in, in the mountains and to let it fly you, actually, just like a yeah. glider. I have a little bit of, uh, of gliding experience, and I do suggest to, to pilots that do the ESLO stuff in, in, in the mountain 
to to go as a passenger a few times to really see what a glider can do and to understand how to read the mountains, the updraft, the downdraft, uh, uh, the shadows of the wind. Uh, uh, not only rely on 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 a on a flag that is indicating you something because 50 meters where you have to land, maybe 50 meters on the left, you have another wind. So I do suggest to pilots to take a few a few spins in a glider to really see what uh, uh, what the wind can do on, on a machine. Yeah, I think that's uh, fantastic advice. I mean, you know, when you're already flying at the limit, you know, the wind can either be your best friend or it's your worst enemy. Yeah, and absolutely. you know, you have to make it you have to make it work for you, not against you. And so, yeah, I hundred percent agree. What about physiologically? What is it? What is it like for your body to well, be spending like, a lot of time at high altitude? Let's say, like, uh, I see the difference on the evening, a little bit more tired by those laps that you go on, on high altitude. Uh, we have our base is at about uh, 3,000 feet, let's say 4,000 feet, and uh, one rotation up to the 15,000 and way back, it takes about 10 to 13 minutes. So you really de- do a, a big amount of uh, altitude changement and you come back. So I'm not also a very fit person. Like I, I don't run a lot. I don't like to go walk in the mountain. So <laughs> I spend my time by my job and, and that's what I like to do. And uh, that's it. But I, I can feel a little bit, the, maybe the first rotation in the morning, you feel a little bit of dizziness, like the, the, but for a few seconds uh, and then you get used to it. I mean, but you really have also to respect your body. This is what I was also talking with and a very experienced pilot that I took for a, for a ride over there. Uh, he never been that high and he was feeling the altitude. And they said, in my case, it's very important when I descend that I take my time. Uh, I cannot descend on, on, the, on, the, on the speed that the machine could achieve. Like on the, on the vertical speed, I could really get to be faster and save money. And that's all this commercial discussion in our world. But uh, I really have to descend slowly and understand when I compensate in a good way. So uh, you have to, to keep in mind it. Uh, you have to be ready to the cold as well, because uh, warm and cold, you start from a wo- warm environment <laughs> yeah. and you get to a cold environment as well. Uh, it's it's great. We Anyway, I would say like we have also oxygen in, in the cabin. So if you spend yeah, I was gonna time, ask it. you can also put your oxygen on and, and, and that's it. I mean, but as we, we spend very, very short time on those altitude, we, we have a specific uh, approval that we don't need it. So okay. For a very so short you, time cause you're just like there, there and then you're down. Yeah. We, we never also switch off the helicopter up there also because you don't have a very nice landing place. You just, uh, pose your skids. You just put your skids on, on this, on a slope, people descend and, uh, and then you fly back. Uh, so anyway, you have to be ready for everything. Like I always yeah. have warm clothes with me and, uh, some water. And uh, anyway, the oxygen, that's clear. What is, um, in that area, I mean, do you have any good forced landing opportunities? You know, if, if you have an engine failure or you have a chip light or well, something. Let's say like when you are at 4,500 meters, you have a lot of time, 15,000 feet, you have a lot of time to get on rotation. <laughs> so you can really yeah. glide, take your time and find a good spot. But anyway, we're spot. talking about a mountain, mountain region. Like uh, uh, these are all narrow valleys. Like the Alps are all narrow valleys in our region, in Switzerland, I would say, but also in in the most part of Italy, uh, because there are not only the Alps in Switzerland, but we have also Alps in in Italy, and uh, they are majestic as well. Uh, so uh, let's say, like when you're flying your normal mission, I, I do things some sometimes about force a landing opportunity. I have to be honest, I don't think about it all the time because if not, I would quit my job. That's clear. Because I would say like, uh, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. I, if I have to be scared by something happening in my career, I actually have to change my career. Uh, you have to be ready. You have to be trained. I totally agree about it. But uh, you can spend, especially in the Eslo mission where we know we spend all the day in the, in the dead man uh, paragraph. On, or the line, I don't know how it's called, but the, the dead, the dead man's curve. The dead man curve. We spend most of our days there. Uh, you are aware of. You're ready to react. I, 
I had some troubles as well in, in my career. I, I can explain, not big deal, but some scary moment. That's that's clear. And uh, it's not the altitude. I mean, it's, it's very the job, how you take it, how you, you, you're ready to react in case something happens. Yeah, I mean, you can't always, I mean, you ha- like you said, you have to be prepared for, for things to happen, but you can't dwell on those. And in no. the helicopter world, there's always a give and take. You know, if, if you want to get this job done, you have to be in the height velocity diagram. You know, you're going to be within that. That's just the risk that is acceptable to take for that operation. And so you're always, you know, anything we do in life is, is kind of risk versus reward. Helicopters is certainly no different. Obviously, the stakes are a little bit higher, you know, in a helicopter, say, compared to the risk of getting in your car and driving to the store. Yeah. It's probably yeah. even more dangerous, to be honest. You know, it's, but we, it's just an yeah, acceptable absolutely. risk that we're so used to. And so I agree 100%. You have to be ready, but you can't necessarily dwell or stew on it uh, because, yeah, you're right. You just, <laughs> You would live. You would live in bubble wrap and not fly. You know, if you were, yeah. and, uh, if you were scared. If you're scared, then also if when when something happens and you're always scared by what could happen in that moment, you black out. I mean, if you're not scared, something happens, you deal with it. Uh, but um, it, it's a it's a diff- difficult thing to explain because when people often in, by Instagram, I see comments about my job, my approach my flying style uh, and you fly too low and then you're, <laughs> you're not standard approach. Uh, then you don't, you're, you're on the limit of the machine. That's clear. I mean, I get it. I know. And uh, unfortunately in this way, this is our job. We have to yeah, comply with that... And uh, I mean, like if, if I would be at the Bahamas in Bermuda flying passengers around, I totally agree that maybe flying 10 meters, or 30 foot over the sea for one hour is, is stupid. But if you live in Switzerland and you have to fly in a valley, that's it. That's the valley. You don't have the option to fly on the shore or, sure. or to keep an higher altitude. I mean, uh, and sometimes I, I, I get a little bit not upset, but uh, sad about those pilots that say uh, this is absolutely impossible. What if what you're, you have an engine loss? Yeah, I, I understand that. I understand, but... Uh, how, as I said, if I, if I have to spend my day and we fly from six to seven hours in the helicopter all day and I have to spend all the time thinking, what if my engine quits? Uh, I would not perform it in the right way. I would have more problems and increase my risk as well because yeah. then you're not concentrated on what you do. I mean, uh, then yeah, we I mean, have look, standard there's... procedures. We have uh, very good trainings. You're ready to react. Uh, you know that something can happen and we, we are not just denying and say it never happens to me. I mean, in my opi- in my personal career, I always said it could happen to me. I want to learn from others and uh, that's it. But you have to... I mean, every every job, every helicopter job has a different profile. And within that job, whatever mission you're doing, you have to fly in that profile. You know, if... You know, flying over even a, a mundane, you know, I did a very pretty easy job. I flew tours in the Grand Canyon. Very easy, right? But there's a section where you're landing and you're coming over, you're over the Colorado River. It's very dark, murky, muddy water. If you if you go in the water, which is your only opportunity for a forced landing, you're screwed. Your passengers are definitely screwed. Yeah. Um but that's what you have to do to land at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So you, you always have to kind of take that acceptable risk uh, and every mission is different. And so, you know, social media again is a good place and a bad place, right? Because yeah. when you, when you, when you post videos and do things on there, you do put yourself in a little bit of a vulnerable position to have those people kind of, what we would say in the States, Monday morning quarterback, what you're doing. <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, you're the professional. You're the guy that's gone through all your training in Switzerland. The guy that's done all the required mountain training, done all your uh, levels of external load training up to level three, I think, or is it level four now? Or are level you still four, yeah. level four? I mean, so it's not like you don't know what you're doing. You know exactly what you're doing. And so, you know, that's what makes you a professional. So yeah, haters going to hate. Don't worry about it. Uh, I think your content's awesome. 
before we wrap up for our listeners that might not uh, know your content or your, your profile on Instagram, where can they find you? Uh, simply on, uh, under my name, Lucas Riva. That's it. Easy. Uh, I'm not, I'm not Lucas the pilot or stuff like that. He's this. not pilot, <laughs> pilot like Lucas. <laughs> no, but I, I'm not, I'm not looking to, to make it like grow to, to get the advantage of it. I mean, I, I do really enjoy when, when people see what I see, like, uh, I'm very lucky in this moment to fly in, in the most beautiful place of Switzerland and Italy. So with some of the best companies, some of the greatest machine, because I think the H125 is absolutely the great machine in the world at the moment. And I do like to, to share it. That's it. I mean, like, I don't care if a pilot uh, thinks it's dangerous, thinks it's not good, thinks it's not nice, thinks it's, I do it only for followers or stuff like this. Uh, I helped, I, sorry, I not, didn't help. I had many requests from young people to approach the pilot profession. And uh, every day I, I get five to 10 of these. And I do answer to everyone because I really want to to be a, a bit, little bit like of a, uh, an ambassador of, of the pilot work because in Switzerland and in Europe at the moment we are losing young people nobody wants to pay $200,000 to get a license and not get a job uh, that, that's clear that's also the market at the moment it's a, a very big lack of pilots and not especially pilots of experienced pilots so if sure. tomorrow we have 100 youngs they come with a commercial license we don't fix the problem I mean uh, and, and the fact that I work for four different companies as a freelance, this shows that there is the need, that is the necessity. to A hundred percent. And that's what I like about my, my social media. It's, yeah, it's so cool. I mean, I think I would argue that you probably have one of the coolest office views uh, in the world. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, watching your videos. And uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, one of the coolest things about social media is that I do think that people like you are inspiring the next generation to get into aviation. And I think that's super important. Yeah. And so, you know, I think what you're doing is awesome. I, I really that like being... what you say, because this is, sorry if I interrupt, but this is also no, you're good. what I, I wanted to do when I was a uh, radio controlled helicopter pilot. I, I was really inspired young people and a lot of, of people entered this world for, for the videos, for the social media side at that time was on mainly Facebook. But uh, I see now, uh, I really enjoy people making a good advertisement of aviation in every aspect, airplanes, helicopters, uh, also the, the background we have, mechanics and stuff like this. You know, it's super important. And I think that uh, it's a way for, for young people to see how amazing this career can be. And, you know, I think it's, it's I have no doubt that people like you are, ha, people are making life decisions because of you, because of seeing what you do, what I do, what other pilots do. People are making decisions to go and enter in this career. My dog's shaking there. Sorry if you can hear him in the background. It's my podcast dog, Shiner. You know the rules of podcasting. You're not supposed to be noisy. I can pet you though. Uh, he usually doesn't make noise. Hi, buddy. But anyway, Lucas, we are uh, kind of hitting our time. So I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, to our listeners, thank you guys so much uh, for supporting the Helicopter Podcast. Since you support it, I get to then put resources into reaching out uh, to, to guys like Lucas and providing great and fun content. Uh, the The coolest thing about the podcast for me is while I'm having these conversations, I'm getting to learn so much about the industry that I that I feel like I know a lot about already. And so it's so fun to be able to talk to new guys like Lucas and learn what helicopters have, have been to them, what helicopters mean to them and what they do within our industry. And so uh, I'm just grateful for, for you all listening and tuning in a special thanks again to our sponsors. Uh, obviously the, the show is uh, brought to you by vertical helicast. If you haven't checked out the new platform, I highly recommend it. It's the helicopter podcast, the hangar Z podcast and the real rescue so check it out. And again, special thanks to Celicopter and Bell Helicopters for again, making this possible. And of course, Lucas, thank you for joining the show. Thanks to you. Uh, it was a pleasure. I know we had some technical difficulties on the first round, so I really appreciate you <laughs> yeah. uh, being flexible. Uh, it means the world to me. And I'm so excited to stay in touch. I'm going to be in Germany in a couple of weeks uh, uh, working a 135 deal. 
uh, outside of Frankfurt. So I'll be, I'll be close to, uh, closer to you, but, uh, okay. <laughs> just there for a short time, but hopefully I can make my way to Switzerland sometime, uh, meet you in person and actually check out what you do in person. That would yeah, just be, be such an incredible experience. So, uh, thank you again, Lucas and Thanks to our to listeners. Thank you so much for listening to the helicopter podcast.